Praise the Lord. We want to welcome you to our Bible study. It's Tuesday evening. Amen. We want to settle down in the presence of God. And we thank God for his keeping power. We have tremendous, tremendous testimony that the Lord is able to keep. And for that we see the God in the highest and on earth goodwill to all men. And we pray for a brother and the Lord heard our prayers. And he delivered. Amen. We thank God for life. Yeah, we thank God for life. So I've sent a message. I want to see that young man so that he must come. And let us, first of all, must testify of the goodness of God. And secondly, God has given him another chance. Come on now. Another chance for salvation. To serve the Lord. He came that he might have what? Life. That's why he came. And so today we are so happy rejoicing. In the midst of everything that is going on, our God reigns. Our God reigns. So we thank him for a, a good testimony. He's alive. Sister Portia's son is alive. He's doing well by the grace of God. So amen and amen and amen. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your keeping power. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul admonishes us, and again I say, rejoice. And so we rejoice this evening. Oh, hallelujah. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So we thank you. And we pray that you will speak to us even as we look at your word. We examine your word. Open your word to us. Speak to us. Yes, Lord. Show us. Teach us. Dissect us, examine us, correct us, change us, transform us, move us. Do, God, only what you alone can do. We thank you today. We say have your way today in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. 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 I want to welcome Sister Hannah up here on Facebook. Welcome to you. She's viewing, I think, from New York. How are you doing, Sister Kim? Melissa, how are you? Thank you for joining Welcome to you. Amen. Welcome to Sister Nye hiding there upstairs. She's viewing from right here in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Tripp, how are you doing? Family, they all just locked on. Welcome. Thank you for joining. Mr. Rona Craig, grace and peace be unto you. Thank you for joining. Sister Natalie O'Brien, how are you? Grace and peace. And Red Ashton, Pentecostal Lighthouse Tabernacle. That's Red Ashton. Grace and peace. Be unto you. Welcome, all those on Facebook, YouTube, and those in person. Sister Beverly Cummings, she's here. Sister Buddha, she's here. Sister Lane, how are you doing? Brother James, great to see you. Amen. Sister Marcia Hutchinson, yes. And Sister Marshall, yes. Brown, Lord have mercy. Welcome. Thank you. That's all right. Brown, Wills, Wills, Brown, same person. Dr. Lewis, great to see you. I see you have locked on. God bless all of you. We are looking at the gospel according to Matthew. And we have been studying that and we cannot believe it's six months already. The year is fast coming to an end. But we are enjoying, I hope you are, the study of this gospel. And we are at the point where we, um, we call this uh, chapter 5, and the name we give it was what? The Constitution of Heaven. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. We designated those chapters the Constitution. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's saying to us, as you enter the kingdom, this is how I want you to be here. This, this should be, these things will guide your character and conduct. And as you continue in the kingdom, this is also how I want you to behave. And so, we are looking one by one. When I tell you what happened, Sister Kate, let me tell you what happened to me. I was doing what is called a post-evaluation analysis of what I'm sharing. 
And I realized that, you know, I should go a little bit deeper, a little more explanation. You see how I'm crazy? I think I might be chasing and running the, the, the beatitude a little bit too quickly. I decided I need to get some, you know, really teach. Let me tell you, my heart is to teach. I want to teach. I want you to know everything I know. When I think you have achieved that, I will leave you alone. But I want to really share the word of God, this one thing. So, I decided I'm going to really look to see what more God, the Holy Spirit, can help us out with. Because I want application. I want you to understand the beatitude. We mustn't just read them, but we must understand the beatitude. We're in chapter 5, we finish with verse 5. And verse 5 was what? Blessed are those who hunger. No, that's it. No, not that one. Blessed are what? Are the meek, for they will what? Inherit the earth. Mr. Melanie Sarais, good evening to you, welcome, and I'm, oh, I forgot, thank you very much for those comments, commendations, congratulations at the pastor's appreciation. You know, Sister Melanie um, is in New York, and she sent greetings, she's the sister of Sister Griffin, and I really want to thank you and your husband for taking the time off. We feel as though we are family, well be off. And so thank you and your husband very much. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. I think that was verse 5. That's, that's all. Yeah. And uh, so we moved on from there. So I want to take a little more time with, uh, with the others. Chapter 5, verse 6. Somebody read it for me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed. But Ashton, you Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Some translation has after righteousness. Mine has for righteousness. Come on. For they will be what? I like that. Well, that's a serious word. They will be filled. For the poor. Righteousness would include having their basic needs. For food milk. But it goes on to include desire to see God's standards established and obeyed in every area of life. And if we can put up, do you have Isaiah 55? Yeah. Verse 1. Again, God promises that his purpose will be accomplished and that his justice will eventually reign. How does Isaiah 55 verse 1 read? Read for me, please. I can't hear you. It's on the screen. Go, oh, everyone who are thirst, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come. Buy and eat. Come. Buy wine and milk. Without money and without cost. Come. All those who are thirsty, come. Come, people, come. Blessed are those, Elder. Mr. Beverly, would you please close the door? Blessed are those, Elder, who hunger. That's the one we're reading. Matthew 5, verse 6. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And as you know, it says, for they will be what? Filled, is the Bible. They will be filled. I want to take some time with this because it's important. As we look at verse 6, and let's look at this particular aspect. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, this beatitude speaks of a very strong desire. It speaks of a driving pursuit. Follow me please. It speaks of a driving pursuit. It speaks of a passionate force inside of us. An ambition if you will. 
and ambition is a word that can be used in a good sense also not just bad it can also be used in a bad sense but the word ambition can be used in a good sense and so if, if at the time there are a lot of people who had ambitions lucifer had an ambition yes. yeah. there are so, so many throughout scriptures who had ambition to do things there are a lot of things that people strive for and pursue and and have a passion for and have ambition to see fulfilled. But there are a lot of strong desires that are also perverted. That go in the wrong way. Don't worry. I'm just I'm just don't worry, media team. I'm just going on. Don't worry. At this. Leave that up. There are a lot of desires that the goal that that are strong, a lot of strong desires that are perverted and they go in the wrong way, not in the way that God would want, but nevertheless, ambition. The point I'm making is nothing is wrong with ambition, nothing is wrong with passion. There are people in this world who are very strong, but they're passionate about certain things. They are so passionate that when they speak to you, you can hear it, you can feel it, you can see it. They are passionate for equality and they are passionate for justice. And oh, oh, they're passionate. Nothing is wrong with passion. Nothing is wrong with a resolute drive. Nothing is wrong with a great desire. Here's the problem. Nothing is wrong with it if. Nothing is wrong with ambition if, nothing is wrong with passion if it is for the right thing. Are you hearing me? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Happy are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, that is a very strong statement, as are all the others. Listen, food and water are necessities, brethren. Food and water. Isn't that the truth? Okay. Are necessities. You remember that? That's right. They are necessities. Very necessary. Here is the point. So is righteousness. Okay. Yes. Did you get that? Food and water are necessities. And some time ago, I, I'd spoken to you about, uh, we seem, today we seem to be living just to eat and wear clothes. Food and, necessity, and, 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 and water are necessities. But according to Jesus, so is righteousness. This, this is the first indication. That's the the first indication of this beatitude. That's the first indication. You need righteousness. Oh God. Oh God. You need righteousness as you need food and water. It isn't wrong to hunger. No. It isn't wrong to thirst. It is the most normal thing. It's the, it is the most common drive to hunger and thirst. It is the most necessary drive. The point Jesus is making is so is righteousness. Uh -huh. Oh, this is going to get hot in here because I can see there's a struggle. Righteousness is also a necessity. Our physical life depends on food and water. And we eat. We drink. They say, well not they, but I think my wife told me, I can't remember. But somewhere along the line in my education pursuit, I learned that 70% of your body mass is water. Your cells need 
water. People ought to drink water more, you know. Rather than reach for, for the sodas, drink water. And so, our physical life depends on food and water. Jesus is showing us something very important. Our spiritual life depends, did you hear the word I use? On righteousness. Come on, church. A lot of people are not growing in God because they're not feeding the spirit. Mm. They're not feeding their spiritual lives. And your spiritual life depends on righteousness. You can't live physically without food and water. And could you finish the statement, therefore? You can't live spiritually. Okay, you got it now. Without righteousness. You will never live spiritually without righteousness. See that hunger and thirst after work. Righteousness. Think of the physical aspect. Think of it. Maybe it will give you an idea of the intensity of the words that Jesus have here. The intensity. Think about the physical. We can't live. We can go so many days, they say, without food. Or we can go so many days without water. But there will come a time you're going to have to eat. You're going to have to eat. Oh God. And drink. Why is it we've become so initiated, so anemic spiritually? And so food and water are so necessary. They are so necessary for the physical life. But, but all the horrors that are imaginable of physical hunger, all the horrors you can think about that are imaginable of physical hunger, imaginable, famine, poverty, whatever, sickness, diseases, whatever you can think of, that is as a result of physical hunger. Listen to this statement. Pales in comparison to the horror when you compare it spiritually. It pales when you compare to the horror, the, 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 the horror of spiritual hunger. A hunger that is unfulfilled. Spiritual thirst that is unquenched. All the horrors you can think about and spread in terms of food and physically, it cannot be much if you are not feeding the spirit. We can only go through the motion of Christianity for so long. One day you're going to be found out. <laughs> oh Lord. Physical elements are only a small token of a deeper, a more serious hunger that faces mankind. People really think that our number one problem is food. Right now, look, 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 right now, you're looking at the news. The war in Ukraine is creating such catastrophe of cataclysmic proportions. The war is creating hunger, shortage. The potato that you eat is going to be affected. Everything, oil, everything is going to be affected. The war, the people are burning the fields, the grain, rice, bread, everything, and they are panicking. Because we might be on the verge of something catastrophic. But hear me. You wish people will become this desperate for spiritual things. Because we can give people food for the physical. But what we really need is for man shall not live. Mankind and it's, it's a more serious hunger that faces mankind. And what is that? That's a deeper spiritual problem. 
It's not food. It's a deeper spiritual problem. And Jesus is here saying that the real thing that a man needs, could you imagine Jesus not being, is righteousness. And I told you at the beginning, he's talking to his disciples. And anybody coming into the kingdom, and anybody, Jesus offered himself as that bread. I am the bread of life. It's coming down from heaven. Anybody coming into the kingdom must be taught he is your bread. He is your all in all. Sure, you need food, but you need something far greater. He knew people were hungry. He fed them with fish and bread and then told them, I am the bread of life. He offered himself as that water. You need water, you need food, I am all of that. Give me this living water, she said to Jesus. If you only know who's talking to you. Oh, but I like the scripture. See, she asks for water externally. But when you become a child of God, that water that might be symbolic of the Holy Ghost, it's not external anymore because the Bible says, for out of your, oh God, oh God. I shall flow. Good God, that's life. That's life right there. You don't need it externally. It comes from you. When you become a child of God, you walk in life. Where you go, there is life. Because he's with you. He's in you. He's all over you. Oh God, of mercy. Jesus offered himself as the bread. He knew people were hungry. He offered himself as water. He knew they were thirsty. Could I quote for you? Put up Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 13 for me, please. Turn your Bibles. He, he offered himself as that water. Jeremiah, how does it read? Chapter 2, verse 13, 1 3. 1 3. Jeremiah said it vividly. What does he say? For my people have what? Committed what? They have forsaken, forsaken me. Who am I? Who am I? The fountain of living waters. And have hewed them out cisterns. What kind? What kind of cisterns? Broken cisterns that can hold no water. If you don't hunger and thirst after Jesus, whomever or wherever you're drinking after is broken. Oh God, have mercy. It wouldn't satisfy you. Oh God, only he can satisfy I said only God can satisfy. We drink natural water, we still get thirsty next day. Yes. Oh, come on now. We eat food, we still get hungry next day. Yes. Oh, I'm coming to that. that. That's the paradox in that, in that statement. Mm -hmm. God has made man with a thirst. God made us, man, with a thirst and a hunger for him. Do you know that's why people are searching? Because he put in us a thirst and a hunger that nothing can fill except God. God made man with a thirst and a hunger for him, but man refuses the well of living water and makes himself broken cisterns. Oh God, there's so much we can preach that whole day because that's all human beings have been doing, making unto themselves broken cisterns, accruing unto themselves things that they think would satisfy. Hmm. Broken cisterns they make for themselves. And these cisterns can't even hold water. It is so sad today to see people hunger and thirst for the wrong things. Hello. I said it is so sad today to see people hunger and thirst for the wrong things. There is this tremendous movement today in the world. Maybe it has always been there where people are hungering and thirsting for happiness. Yeah. 
Everybody wants to be happy. They'll do whatever it takes just to be happy. You listen to why some people get divorced? One partner says, I am no longer happy. I'm looking for it. This happiness seems to be elusive. I'm always the thirst for happiness. They are thirsting for meaning. They want to know what life means. They, they're running all over. I want to be happy. They're thirsting for fulfillment. Something is wrong on the inside. They, they, they are unfulfilled. And so they're going all over. Looking to be fulfilled. And as a result. Of this hunger and thirst. Inevitably. They try to fill themselves. With certain things. They fill themselves with self-indulgent pleasures. To see whether alcohol will fill me. But I heard from people when I drink and I get drunk tonight, I get a hangover and I wake up next day and I go back to the same thing because somehow I still have the, oh God, the void inside of me. So I keep on drinking, hoping that. And that's why they take cocaine because, see, when I'm told, never did it, but I'm told, when you take the first shot, you get a high unlike anything else. Yeah. What happens is they keep chasing the initial high. They could never recreate that first high, but. They want it, so they keep going after it until, what you call them, they become addicted. I want to be fulfilled. I want, I want happiness in my life. And they try to fill themselves with possessions. Do you know how many people feel fulfilled in their possessions? Big houses. Very expensive cars. Trying to fill that void. You say it like you Jamaicans, name brand shoes, <laughs> brand name. They, they, are, they, are, they are going out and they're trying their best. Some people fill the void with power. Do you know who I am? You know, is it to walk around? Do you know who I am? I have three people walking behind you. Power. Some people try to fill it with praise. They love when people praise them. It fills their ego. Oh, I'm digging deep tonight, Father. They love it. Because they're trying to find. The prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, I think it is. Luke chapter 15, verse 16. The prodigal son, isn't that the truth? He longed for the pleasure. Father, give me my portion. He worked for it, you know, just give me my portion. Divided it up. By the way, that story, this is just impossible. That story is not about the son. You know. We preach it. That's not about the son. That's about the father's love and the father's forgiveness. The prodigal son long for pleasure. There's some people in church and they long to go outside. Church is too restrictive. The prodigal son longed to possess. He longed for popularity. He wants to be. He longed. He just, oh God, give me my portion. And the Bible says he went to a far land. It's amazing. When people want to sin, they move far from. Okay. Okay, because they don't want people to see them. Somebody in this neighborhood might know me. So I've got to go far. This world too small. I can't where you go. Somebody is, hey. You don't need to say, this world is something as you know, you go in Alaska, I'm training right in Alaska, I'm telling you. Man, you know Sam, I'm going You want dead and hard to talk to Alaska, they know you all over. The prodigal son, he longed for the popularity of a riotous life. But he went hungry, he won the outside, but his soul went hungry. And he finally had the sense, the Bible says, 
He finally had the sense to come to himself. What did he say in verse 16? Luke 15, verse 16. What did he say? How many? Luke 15. No, oh, you're Jeremiah. Easy. Luke chapter 15, verse 16. That's all right. He said what? How many of my fathers were? Go to 16 or 17, one of them. And he came to himself. There you go. 17. How many of my father's servant have what? Could you imagine that? Here I am out here. And my first John chapter 2. Let's go to that if you haven't. First John chapter 2. First John. Hebrews, James, Peter, Peter, John. Three Johns. First John chapter 2. Verses 15 to 17. Somewhere around there. Let's bring up 15. First John chapter 2. Ah, I like it. Oh, you hit it on the knee. How does it warn us? It warns that you can't get satisfied in the world. That's what John is telling us. Love not the world. Can't hear you. Neither the things. How do scriptures sound so strange? They're in the book. Love not the world. Neither the things which are in the world. Because what is in the world? The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the what? There you go, beautiful. And the pride of life. That's what your Bible says. That's all in the world. That's all the world give us. That's all the world give us. And the pride of life. And do you know, none of those things abides forever. It's just what? Wind. It will all disappear. So right at the start, as we are studying this here this evening, I want you to ask yourself, all of us, ask ourselves, as we begin this study, as we continue in this study, what are you hungry for? Is it power? Praise? Possessions? Pleasure? What are you hungry for? I don't want you to miss it. Jesus is talking to his disciples. So this is this lesson is for all of us. Jesus is talking to the disciples. What are you hungry for? What is, is this that we hunger for? The Bible says, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst. For what? What is it we hunger for? Righteousness. So the question is, what is this righteousness? What is this righteousness? He says we're supposed to hunger and thirst for righteousness. The book of Amos, the prophet said, The people in the world pant after the dust of the earth. Oh Lord, have mercy. The people in the world pant after the dust of the earth. That's very stupid. But they do it anyhow. They chase after dust, wind, things that will never last. They will be destroyed. They will be burnt up. But nevertheless, every day, they chase after it. It's a never ending chase. That's it. What are you hungry for? The world just pants after the dirt of the earth and you say to me well what are we to hunger for well i'm going to tell you before the night is over what are we to hunger for well some people would say happiness do you know how many people want to be happy some people tell us all i want i want happiness i want happiness that's why we must discuss these things from a biblical perspective i want happiness I guess maybe 
Maybe that's what the world hungers for a lot. Everybody wants happiness. They want happiness. People are really after happiness. They want to be happy, man. They just want happiness. And if, if you could just make them happy, you'll be all right. Just make them happy. Oh, I just, you know, the, the, the thing that always, the thing that always amazes me, Sister Pamela, the glass go from Florida, how are you doing? The thing that always amazes me is the number of amusements we have in our society, in the world. Amusement. Disneyland. Come on now. Ari's Water Park. I mean, in Bahamas is a beautiful uh, 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 place there. I forgot the name. I mean, just, we have so many amusements. And people will pay millions to go to these things. Why? These things make them? Thank you. I want to be happy. I don't have anything against those, you know. So don't stone me. I don't have anything against those things at all. I've been to um, uh, Florida, Orlando. And I've been to see more beautiful. You enjoy yourself until after you realize your credit card is over. But when you're in the moment and you're happy, you're swiping. Oh God, I'm going to say it. All you do is swipe it because you're happy. Just swipe. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you say, and where are we going to stay? We're going to stay in the street. What's the cause? The word is called swipe. You have to go to true value, swipe. That's what you do. You just swipe and, 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 and you enjoy it. Then you go eat. Oh, it's so beautiful. And you buy tickets for everything park. That's it. Yeah, you go. Don't talk about the airfare. Ooh. Man, you only live once. You hear them young people upstairs? You hear them? You only live once. You gotta enjoy yourself. I loved it, Sister K. I enjoyed it. It's only while I was on my way back when I now have my senses and all my faculties collected. That's when I'm doing all the calculations and adding up and realize, for God of mercy, I just can't. Okay, have mercy, Jesus. So to go next year now, I need a whole lot of loan for me. Swipe! Oh man, and if you have your children with you, with your wife, it's worse. Oh, the children let it enjoy themselves. Come the man, just buy things and nice. And everything they see they want. I know I have a friend I like him. He walks with his own food. I love him. That's what you ought to do. Walk with your own food in your mouth. While you're hungry, shut your mouth. Eat this here. Yeah, take some rice. And some body. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> but brother Ashton, that's not happening today. No, 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 that can't happen. Once you go on holiday, come now. You have to eat in a restaurant. Come now. Can't eat no food from home. <laughs> and so they want to be happy. And there you are. And you know the trip back to Trinidad is many hours. That's when you start to. That's when you start calculating to Lord of mercy. You see, the world has a disease. The world has a disease. But it wants to eliminate the pain with what? Happiness. Oh God. The world has a disease. And in order, they want to eliminate it with happiness. But it never wants to deal with the disease. So the world is hungry and hungering and thirsting after what? Happiness. When you want to know something else, there is a sad but a reality. Want to know that? That is even true in the church. There are people in God's house who are hungering and thirsting after Happiness. Yes. I have to get this thing. I, I can't. I can't do without it. They are hungering and thirsting after an ex feeling good. So they move from church to church. Because of chasing after. Come on now. You can go deep with this, you know. They're chasing after it. They want a feeling and this pastor doesn't have the anointing so they're chasing after the next one yeah 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 they, oh 
I meet a lot of people who are Christians. And what they really want, they don't want God. What they want is happiness. I just want to feel good, live a nice life, a quiet life. I ain't troubling nobody. Nobody doesn't trouble me. I pick with Julie Mango. Why good? I live nice with everybody. I want you to remember this. If you're writing, make a note of this I'm going to say. It's not on the board because I was planning today. I want to leave something with you here carefully before I go. Happiness is a byproduct. Happiness is a byproduct. B Y P R O D U C T. One word. Happiness is a byproduct of something. That's why you shouldn't make happiness the end. You have to chase after that thing. And going after that thing, you'll be happy. Oh God, I'm watching. You don't chase after the happiness. Happiness is a byproduct. The Bible says, let's go back to it. Happy are those who are hunger. And thirst, shout the word. After what? Righteousness. It comes as a byproduct of what? Righteousness. You want to be happy in life? You know many songs we sing about happiness? Oh, you know about that one. Do you know many songs we sing about happiness? Mean, everybody wants, yet it is still so elusive. According to Jesus, you want, it's a byproduct of seeking after what? Righteousness. I hope the church, his people, his disciples are listening to me. The world will go change, that's good. Let them do it, but we must do the right thing according to the Bible. You know how many people got married and are still unhappy? Do you know how many people got their dream partner and still unhappy? Got their dream job and they're still unhappy. No only people want the lottery and this. Oh God. They're still unhappy. As a matter of fact, the lottery has been a curse for a lot of people. Because if you can't handle small money, you think you can handle big money. Happiness is a byproduct of what? You have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You want to be happy? Seek righteousness. Not some holy high that you get with a zap, zap, and you get, no, 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 that's not happiness. It is not some experience you find. That isn't what it is. It is D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N. That's the Greek. Righteousness. In other words, that word means justification. To be made right with God. You want to be happy. You don't know life until you know Jesus. Could people live a great life outside of God? No. They might exist. They might live a good life, not a great one. You don't know good life. You don't know until you know Jesus. And what am I saying? Listen, simply, listen carefully. This is it. The only real happiness in life is to be right with God. That's what I'm saying. You don't know what a joy it is to wake up knowing that because of Jesus, I'm in right standing with God. Because I make mistakes every day, but Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I see when God looks at me, he sees not what I used to be, but he sees Jesus. That right there is happiness. You may not have food, but oh, praise God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once I am right with God, that's it. That's it right there. The only real happiness in life is to be right with God. Is everybody listening? Somebody who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. First of all, anybody who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, first of all, seeks salvation. Seek salvation. The righteousness that comes when you believe. 
the righteousness that comes when you believe. When you believe. The righteousness that is given to you in Christ, imputed righteousness. He sees his sin. He sees his rebellion. He sees himself separated from a holy God. He is broken. He is mournful. That's uh, somebody who is seeking and hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Don't tell me, uh, are you hungry and thirsting after righteousness and you live in a sinful life and it's not even bothering you? Something is wrong. The person who is seeking after righteousness sees his brokenness, sees his hunger, sees his rebellion. He sees himself separated from a holy God. He is broken. He is mournful. God, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He is meek. He wants so much to restore himself to God. I need you. I need you now. I need you, God. That's someone who's doing what? Seeking. Thirsty. Thirsty as the deer. Ah, hands. So I show I'm longing. I'm longing for you, God. See why Jesus gave the parable? The Republican in the Senate, he did his chest, he smoked his chest. He wouldn't even look up to God. Have mercy upon me. That's someone who's seeking. He wants forgiveness. And so he hungers and thirsts after righteousness. And that righteousness comes in what? Salvation. He hungers. He has a desire to be free. You know, when you fail God, you know it. If you're hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Once you have the Holy Spirit in you, He convicts you. You know it. I made a mistake. I'm after God. I'm after God. Forgive me, Lord. It is a desire to be free from self. This is a word one of these days I'm going to look at from a scriptural standpoint. This word about self. Today it's a good word. The world loves everything today is about self. But I'm going to show you what the Bible talks about self. It is a desire to be free from sin. Not to court sin. To be free from it. Every time I fail you, I feel it. For every time I stumble. And I bring the Father shame. Every time, every time. A droplet of his precious blood. It still falls upon my name. It's a desire to be free from sin. Have you ever get so upset and disgusted with just failing God over and over? You long for the time when this thing, this thing, Paul calls it the thorn in the flesh. Paul calls it the sinful man, the old man. That thing every day is warring, is warring. You have to crucify, put it to death every day. Every day, every day. You long from its power, from its presence, and you want to be free from its penalty. And that is what initiates salvation. That is somebody who is hungering and thirsting of the righteousness. Are you with me? The second element to that is this. It also implies not only salvation, but sanctification. Hallelujah. I think it also implies sanctification. Listen to me, I don't think once you get saved, you stop hungering and thirsting. Did you hear what I said? When we testify, we say things like, you know, when the Lord said, I was on fire. When you get saved, you don't stop hungering and thirsting after God. Anytime there's a lull, you need to get on your knees. Something is wrong. Until Jesus takes us from this earth, you have to continue. Oh, if I go into the vortex. Oh, you have to continue hungering and thirsting after God. Listen to me. Then you hunger and thirst for sanctification, for an increasing holiness. I 
want to be more than an ordinary Christian. I want to be more like you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Brethren, this is all I want to share for tonight because it's so strong. And I look at all the others a little bit more in depth now. But I don't know how to express this as strongly as I feel it. I hope in your life. I don't know how to express it as strongly as I feel it, but I hope in our lives, in your life, there is this hunger. I'm not talking about religious God. I'm not talking about covering up with religiosity. I'm talking about a genuine God. hunger for Almighty God. I'm not talking about speaking the language that you think people want to hear and putting on a show. I'm talking about a genuine, genuine hunger, a hunger that never stops. The desires to be more and more and more like Jesus Christ. That is the mark of a Christian. Always hungering and thirsting for more. Are you hearing me? You keep on hungering. You keep on thirsting to desire more virtue, more purity, more holiness, more Christ-likeness. You never in Christianity. Mm -hmm. In Christianity, there is no top dog. In Christianity, there is no spiritual giant. You never get to a place where you arrive. As long as you're a child of God, you have to keep hungering. I don't care what degree you have. Hunger and thirst after God. We become so complacent. We think we arrive. We think we know God. You don't know God. You know about God. You know church. You know religion. You know your denomination. You don't know God. Have you ever read Paul? You wrote most of the New Testament. Oh, I feel him. Oh, when I'm in this mood, Jesus. He wrote most of the New Testament. Paul explained for us our theology and the difference between grace and works and the difference between grace and the law. Paul wrote many of the books in the New Testament. Yet Paul, this man, this we would call a giant in the faith. You want me to quote his word? Here's what he said. That I might know him. That's when people in church for 40, 50 years and think they know God. Until we die, I am hungering and thirsting. I need to know you. That's why when I come to worship, I don't want to look around. I don't care what you're doing. I want to worship God. I'm hungry and thirsting. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord. To the what? Draw me near with Jesus. I don't want to hear anything. I want to draw me, me. Search me, oh God, and see if there be any wicked in me. Oh yeah, yeah, search me, Jesus. It doesn't matter how long I'm a Christian. That's why I don't like to get into those things. How long you're a child of God. No, it don't matter, man. It don't matter. It don't matter. Come, you don't plan to leave him anyhow. So this thing is for eternity. It doesn't matter. Just search me, oh God. Oh God, draw me nearer, nearer to you, nearer, 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 nearer. That's the mark of a Christian. You're hungry, you keep on thirsting, you keep on desiring. And that's why sometimes we, you never get to a place where you arrive. And that's the most disgust, disgusting, revolting, sickening attitude there is. Both for unregenerated people. Who say, well, we have saved ourselves. And even Christians who think they have a right. They've been in church so long, they know everything. I don't care wherever I go, I serve God with his people. I don't care what church, what local assembly. I, wherever I go, God's people, how they're doing it, I worship in God. I just, I just worship in God. I just love Jesus. I don't want to lose his fire. I've been home. I think it was last uh, 2019 and my 
What my spiritual father said to me, Fitz, you have not lost your fire. He said, keep it. I said, hey, it ain't my fire. It's God. But well, thank you for the compliment. He said, don't lose it, son. Keep on keeping on, son. Keep on loving God. Keep on until the end. Keep on. Keep on. That's something. Uh, the Christians do think they've arrived. Sons of the kingdom, listen. Sons of the kingdom never stop hungering. Sons of the kingdom never stop hungering. Turn to Philippians 1 verse 9 in your Bible. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 9. Sons of the kingdom never stop. You don't stop. How do you know you're a child of God? Because you don't stop hungering. Turn to Philippians 1 verse 9. Philippians 1 verse 9, how does it read? Anybody has it? I pray that your love may abound what? Yet more and more. Come on, church. Do you know why Paul wrote Philippians? I mean, this is not in the thing, but it just crossed my mind. Do you know why Paul wrote Philippians? Paul wrote Philippians as a thanksgiving. It's, that's why he says, rejoice always. That's why he told him in Philippians, my God shall supply what? All your needs, according to him. He was thanking the, the brethren for what they did for him. He says, I want your joy. I, I pray that your love be abound more and more. More and more. See, you see what I'm talking about? You're not done. It must keep getting more and more. Come on now, you're not done. Come on, come on. Watch this. No matter how much you love, I don't care what you do in the church. Keep on loving people. More and what? And more. It doesn't matter how, how often you've been giving. What must you do? Keep on. Oh God, have mercy. Keep giving until Jesus comes. Because he's your Lord and Savior. He's the one who provides. He's the one who keeps you. So Paul says, more. No matter how much you pray. Oh God. What should you be doing? Keep praying how? You'll see them Thursday morning. You're tired of praying. You can't get tired of praying. You're a child of God. How do you get tired of talking to your father? You keep hungry and thirsty. Praise you talking to your dad, your father. Our oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No matter how much you obey, what must you do? You must obey more. No matter how much you think you like Christ, you must think like Christ more. This should be the consuming desire, the never-ending Blessed are they which do continually hunger and thirst. Yeah. Blessed are they which continually. Now, today you're hungry. Six months from now, we have to crank you again. Yeah. So we live our lives, huh? We don't. Oh, God have mercy. Oh, God have mercy. This should be the consuming desire. Blessed are they which do continually hunger and thirst. The word now says, look, the word now, you are, you are now in doing this. First he says, first he says, blessed. You are now in doing this. Blessed. You are now in doing hunger and thirsting. The first thing you are now what? You are blessed. I said you are blessed. And the last, he says, what? Well, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, or blessed are they, first one, blessed. Uh, they that, what's the last one? He says, they shall be what? What? I can't hear you. Yes. Fill. The word fill is super. It's a good word. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They shall be filled. And we can spend a whole lot of time talking about fill. Fill my group. We can spend a whole lot of time talking about fill it up. I lift it up. Yes, basically, it's a word used to further up, F-O-D-D-E-R, an animal. 
It's a word used to feed an animal. Hmm. It means to be absolutely what? Satisfied. Did you hear the adverb in front? It means to be absolutely satisfied. I'm going to show you a great paradox and bring it to an end. They shall, by the way, the word shall is illegal. They love to use it because it's definitive. There's no if, maybe, or on the other hand. If it says shall, it means it is so. Yes. They shall be satisfied. God wants to make us happy and what? Satisfied. satisfied. Oh, glory be to God. Only you satisfied with what? Well, with what they're hungering for. What are they hungering for? Thank you very much. They are hungry and thirsty after righteousness. And when you're hungry and thirsty after righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Isn't this a fabulous paradox? You know what you mean by paradox in English? It's almost the opposite. It's almost like a contrast. Isn't it a fabulous paradox? You are satisfied, but you're never really Oh God, I'm mercy. Oh, I love this. So Jesus satisfies. But because it's a continuous thing, you're never really. And the fact that you're never really satisfied, it means it's to keep you going after. Come on now. So on the one hand, he satisfies you completely. But then there is a space that makes you keep going after him. Oh, I like this paradox. They shall be satisfied. It's a fabulous paradox. You are satisfied. But never satisfied. Isn't that great? You hunger and thirst and you are satisfied, but you're never really satisfied. <laughs> I love it. Now, here's a question that I'm done. Two minutes after seven, I'm done. How do I know, somebody may ask me, if I am really hungry now and thirsting after righteousness? How do I know that? How do I know? If I'm really hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Well, I'm going to leave some things with you. Number one. How do you know? Are you deeply dissatisfied? Put up Romans 7, 24 for me, please. Thank you. Are you deeply dissatisfied? Do you find yourself in Romans 7, verse 24? All the time saying Romans 7 24, saying that. What, what, how, how it reads? Oh, wretched man that I am. I like Paul. Paul is. Listen to the statement. Who shall deliver me? Yeah, 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 yeah. From the body of this death. Listen to me. Paul says, Who shall deliver me? Let me see. Uh, uh, who? Watch this. Look at the English now. Paul, the, the Bible says who. This translation says who. Mine as who. Who refers to people. You don't use who for things. If you're going to talk about a person, you have to use who. That's called a relative pronoun. Watch this now. It is only a person and not a thing that can deliver you from the body of death. It had to be somebody that Paul is talking about. Of course, you know, later on, he will say, I thank my Lord. Oh, I love it. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Do you find yourself saying, oh, wretched man that I am? Or are you living your life like everything good with you? Then you know that you're not hungry and thirsty. If you're dissatisfied with yourself, then you are hungry and thirsty. But if you are so self-righteous, that you think everybody else is wrong and you are right, you're in danger. Are you dissatisfied with yourself? If there is in you any sense of satisfaction, I wonder whether you know what it is to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Next, how do I know I'm hungry and thirsting after righteousness? Does anything external satisfy you? Mm. Ask yourself that. Do you find things bear influence on how you feel? Feel things.
things you get better in your life if you just buy something new. I will have a greater self-esteem if I get this dress for all years night service. Glory be to God. The things external, do they satisfy you? Are you good? Because you get 2% You fill up your appetite with wrong stuff and then you lose your appetite. Listen to this. A hunger for righteousness will be satisfied with nothing else but righteousness. Are you hearing me? All right. All right. Number three. Do you have a great appetite for the word of God? You ask the question, how do I know? But I'm answering it in the best way God would have me. Do you have a great, not just an appetite, a great appetite for the word of God? You know when you, it, it's, listen, it is not pleasant to watch a hungry man eat. Have you ever seen a hungry man? Come on, he can tell you. And one of them boys in the cell, have you ever seen a hungry man eat? It is not a pleasant thing to see a hungry man eat. And when he gets done slurping, when he gets done, see? see, see like, oh, when you see a hungry man eat, Lord have mercy. What's our food? Where do we find the righteousness of God? Now I'm asking you, where do we, what's our food? Where do you get your food from. Come in the church pastor. I could look at TV. Where are you getting your food from? And what is the quality of the food that you're eating? Uh, uh, Lord, I'm going to finish now because it's, it's terribly hot in here. Where do we find the righteousness of God? Here are the rules. Where do we find the righteousness? Here are the rules. The obedience to which brings about righteousness in this world. Jeremiah said, Thy words were found and I did eat them. The psalmist said, How oh, we are with a young man. Thy word is a lump. The entrance of your word. Jesus is the word, the rim of the Logos. Do you have a deep desire for the word or is you know when pastor done preach, well, that is it. We preach next week Sunday, we're gonna come back and go from the Bible. Exactly. We'll hear that next week Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right word, right at it, see? If you're hungry and thirsting after righteousness, you will have such an appetite for the word that you will do as a hungry man. You will devour it. Yes. You will eat it. You will devour this word. It's such a beautiful thing when you're studying God's word and you're discovering things. Sometimes you have to put your pen down and go, wow. You, yes. you study the thing. You say, Lord of mercy. This is it. This is beautiful. This is tremendous. You will devour it. You never, I have never, listen. When you're hungry and thirsting after righteousness, you never, all right, I have never seen anybody beg a hungry man to eat. Are oh, you so quiet? I have never seen anybody beg a hungry man to eat. You don't have to beg a hungry man to eat. Eat him. You have to beg him to stop. Nobody begs a hungry man to eat. Have you? Sometimes, Sunday after Sunday, Tuesday after Tuesday, we come in here. Please study your Bible. Please read your Bible. Please go home with me. And last did you read your Bible. Oh, I know it was since 2019 Christmas. Oh, I wish you'd read your Bible. Oh, if only you would read your Bible. Day after day, week after week. 
Well, if you're not hungry and thirsting after righteousness, then you are not functioning as a child of the kingdom. Hello? If you're not hungry and thirsting after righteousness, you're not functioning as a child of the kingdom. Should sure, maybe you are a child of the kingdom just being sinful. Just being sin sinful. Maybe you're not even a child of the kingdom. But you're forfeiting happiness in either condition. Ask yourself, do you have a great appetite for the word of God? Are there things of God speak to you? Are the things of God speak to you? Some of you all know what I'm, some of you will know what I'm talking about. Some of you aren't, but listen to this. This is so beautiful. Proverbs 27, 7. Just listen to this. To the hungry soul, every bit of thing is sweet. Oh God. Did you hear that? To the hungry soul, every bit of thing is sweet. You know I can tell somebody hungry and thirsting. For righteousness, because when God brings devastation in his or her life, they are still filled with satisfaction because they know that God is still with them. Mm -hmm. Even though it's painful, did you get that? There are some people, they can only rejoice when God does good things for them. And when tough things happen, they don't like it. Well, they're not hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Because if you know God, you know in all things. It doesn't matter. Your steps are ordered by God. He's going to watch over you. He's going to protect you. They are chasing happiness superficially. If you're really hungry and thirst after righteousness, it will be unconditional. You say, what do you mean? Well, you remember the rich round, uh, young ruler who came? I want to know how I can enter the kingdom. And the Lord said, really? Are you, you really want to know how you can enter the kingdom? Are you willing to sell what? All that you have and give it to the poor. No. He was hungry. But his hunger was conditional. I will serve God. But. His hunger was conditional. And he never was filled. What about yours? You say, oh, I want Christ. But I want my sin too. Mm. I want Christ. And I want to keep my pride. Well, you finish now. Okay, stop. Boy, I'm finishing with. I want Christ. And I want my illicit relationship. I still want to carry on with what I'm doing. Yeah. It's not Christ plus. It's Christ and Christ alone. Yes. You can't want him plus. Yes, right. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word. We that hunger and thirst after righteousness. We thank you for your word. I pray that this word will resonate with us. Help us to hunger and thirst after you correctly. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want to thank you for joining us, listening. Thank you. Thank you all those who are online. Thank you very much. Those of you who came in person, we'll continue our study of Matthew. May the Lord bless you. Of a tremendous week. In the name of the Lord. You have an announcement? May the Lord bless you tremendously. Thank you for coming. Grace and peace be unto all of you. God bless you.